Alright guys, we're turkey hunting, and we're actually rained out from turkey hunting. We're not turkey hunting, believe it or not. <laughs> we're sitting at the back of the truck, and it is raining. And it's been kind of slowing down, so we decided to try to record a podcast. So if you hear some light sprinkles, hopefully it's more soothing than annoying. We tried to find the best place to be where it wasn't loud. In the truck was loud. In the... I guess gazebo areas that we found around it was all just super loud so tin, tin roof, roof. Yeah. Just <laughs> <laughs> feel like picked back up too just yeah. in time yeah just in time for us to start but it's just one of those days and i guess in this one we're going to be starting the conversation just talking about hunting new areas because we're currently hunting a new area for turkey and um we're definitely struggling. I guess you'd always hope that there's some amount of figuring it out that goes on when you go to a new spot and then you kind of chip away at it and then eventually find some success. And that's always really rewarding. But in this situation, it's not going necessarily as planned. And that's okay. And we just want to talk about like what we're trying to get out of hunting new locations and you know, some of the things that we like learning and the new challenges and everything like that. Just kind of elaborate on that. I guess how do you, f- like, first approach a new area when you first get there? Because it can be, I guess, intimidating in a way. Yeah. New country, just not familiar with terrain or vegetation, whatever it may be. It's like, I don't know, I guess to, uh, to throw a question in there, what would you mm-hmm. first, what do you first take in when you're going to the, a new, completely new area? I think the number one thing is always just spending a lot of time time looking at maps and then whether it's deer, turkey, elk, it doesn't really matter. I don't really like being right close to a big city or a bunch of towns. Like that's kind of important to me. Um, And then the next step is just looking for habitat changes. I mean, this gets hammered home a ton, so I don't necessarily want to dive too much into that, but um, looking for some sort of habitat break, like timber cuts, I mean, fields sometimes, sometimes um, burnt areas, anything that's some sort of obvious change on the the habitat. And then um, terrain-wise, I really always enjoy trying to find some sort of rugged terrain. I mean, when we're talking turkey or like elk especially, I really, really like that. But also for deer, I enjoy learning more and more about that because I feel like that brings a whole new list of challenges that you don't always get everywhere. So um, I feel like those are some of the things like right out of the gate that I try to focus in on. And then ideally room to roam in, in different options, like not just one particular location I mean, if I got a lot of time to look, like, let's say I'm going in deer or elk season and I've got all summer to get excited about a spot, I want, like, you know, 15 or 20 different options that I'm really excited about with no expectation of really getting to all of them. Yeah. I would say that's the, the start. I think having options is huge. That's what, kind of what I try to focus on, like, the first couple of days when I'm in a new area. It's just, like, even if I do hear bird dive in on them and it doesn't work out like Mm -hmm. i generally won't spend too much time the first day Mm -hmm. and just try to like i'll keep tabs on them but try to uh go and collect other options and that's what hayden and i did the first day really and honestly opening day was like probably our best day aside from the day that he left um we got pretty close that date but opening day we i mean found these farm birds that we've been Mm -hmm. on for a couple days now and then very quickly backed out of there and went to another spot and honestly like if we would have killed that bird it would have just been sheer luck like it was just one of those where he's gobbling 200 yards off the road Mm -hmm. we got in the bulldozer bird. yeah the bulldozer bird got in right on top of them and just like ended up spooking them but i told hayden even even if we had gotten that bird like We wouldn't have learned anything. Yeah. Like, it really would just have been luck. And there would have been a little bit of, like, bittersweetness to, like, not really feeling like I've learned anything about how to hunt this area. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
we had a very similar experience to that. I know my perspective, it was the first morning within the first hour and a half and we were in this spot that I was, it was really cool looking. I was really excited about it. And I was like, man, we get to hunt this for several days at least. And then that thing's gobbling and we start going down and you're looking out at all the country that you, that you haven't yeah, hunted yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, man, if this happens, we got to leave already. Mm-hmm. And now that compared to where we're at here on day eight or whatever it is and we've seen a lot more ground and learned a lot of cool things about it so now it's kind of like okay we'll take the we'll take the easy route but early you don't always want that i mean you would never pass it up obviously but there is um a desire to learn and i think that you know when we've been making these videos i've often thought to myself like man we could leave we could go somewhere else you know, we could always take some sort of hand out. I mean, there's there's all kinds of opportunities for us to go, really, to go to private or, you know, we get a lot of uh, people saying, you know, you come hunt my property, I'd be happy to have you. And, and I, while I appreciate that greatly, I think that's awesome. The reason that we don't do that is because we like going and figuring things out, trying to learn the challenges that are unique to a certain area because they all have unique challenges. and. We, we joke a lot about the toughest turkeys live here. Well, a turkey's a turkey everywhere. Every place, though, creates a new challenge. And figuring that list of challenges out, what they even are, and then overcoming those challenges is what actually makes the turkey tour or the deer tour or you know, elk hunting a new place fun. Is you're just going, trying to figure out what that list of challenges is figure out how you're going to overcome it and i feel like man we could just go to a place where maybe we could roll in and you know you're always wondering is it is it what's the old saying like grass Grass. is greener on the other side right we Mm -hmm. could roll down to a spot and hear like three turkeys move right in and get one wouldn't that be sweet it's like yeah it would be sweet but think about how freaking awesome it's gonna be when one's drumming down the pipe you know and we're shaking like Mm -hmm. those hunts are the ones that really end up being the most memorable to me the ones that there was some sort of you know i guess the kids are calling it a grind you know you're really working hard you're gonna break it down yeah step by step yeah i have a little bit of a grass is greener streak in me yeah it it came out in alabama last year because i i rolled into a spot and shot one the first day I was there. And then they have the rule that you can't, like, shoot more than one within the first 10 days of the season or something like mm-hmm. that on a specific WMA. So I, that afternoon, went and scouted another place, was there the morning. And then I was like, yeah, I'm going to go somewhere else. Went to another place, scouted the afternoon, was there the morning, was like, ah, not really feeling it. And then you just, like, end up wasting a mm-hmm. bunch of time yeah. if you do that. Yeah, well, that's that's the other thing. It's like we run the risk, too, of finding pretty much exactly what we found, which is is some turkeys, you know. And I think there's probably more here. Well, I guess we're starting to believe there's more turkeys here um, than what maybe we initially thought just because the season's starting to change. Like, as I'm sitting here looking at what's surrounding us and how much it's changed since we got here, it's pretty wild. And they're definitely starting to move. We're starting to see hens alone moving away from, you know, the other groups of turkeys, and that's not something we were seeing before the day before season. today. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. which is crazy to think about. Wow. Yeah, it really is. Mm -hmm. First male bird we've seen. Whoa. (laughs) Whoa. (laughs) I think we've been close to a few. Yeah. At least yeah, I think. But the biggest thing that I want to get out of the experience is just learn something and just know that, you know, this is a challenge. I don't just want to go get one any, anymore. I think when I was a teenager, especially, for example, or even up into college, it's like, yeah, I want to go get one. And when you have limited time, there's nothing wrong with that mentality either. There is not. But, like, we have the opportunity to go travel to new areas. And we've got to see tons of new country just in the last handful of years. And when that's the case, you start to just really appreciate the things that you can learn from an area. I think that's the coolest part about traveling and and no matter what you're hunting. You just got this really amazing opportunity to learn new things that, you know, may um, be challenges that are only unique to that certain area or 
those habitat types or whatever. And then you get to also see the hunting culture too. Like one of the things that I always find interesting and I've kind of started saying for years now is everywhere you go, there's a hunter tendency. And if you can recognize that throughout your experience there and just try to do something ever so slightly different, it doesn't have to be crazy different, but like a great example is, um, we were hunting mule deer in New Mexico in 2021. And we started noticing that everybody was driving in, or I'm sorry, driving around. So they would be driving around glassing from the road. And while I believe that absolutely could work, by hiking up to high points, we were able to see country that you could not see from the road. And therefore, we were seeing bucks that I think were doing a darn good job of hiding from the normal hunter tendency, was, which was just cruise around and hit obvious glassing points. And... I just think that the deer start to pick up on that in a certain spot or like for example if you're elk hunting and you're just running around doing tons of bugling but everybody else is doing that then there's probably a good chance that that's not that's going to stop working at a certain point so like just recognizing what that tendency is and then try to spin it you know in in your favor a little bit like just use that to your advantage especially rather than getting frustrated at it Mm -hmm. turkey related one that i always think about was we were um, hunting some big ridges in 2020, and I remember hitting some strange point in the middle of a fairly long hunt there where we had got one early. The confidence was really high early, and then because we got one in that particular location, we kind of moved to some different spots, and all of a sudden the pressure increased, and it felt like everywhere we went we were seeing a vehicle. But then we really started looking at it, and it's like, okay, Every hunter is doing the same thing. They're parking on the top, taking the ridge out. And while that's an obvious advantage, when you're up high on a ridge, you can hear a lot down below you, it made us rethink our strategy. So we started focusing on areas that didn't have trails. We could get up to a high point, but then also hunt our way down into a bottom. And ultimately, we ended up having some really good success later in the trip because we started recognizing that hunter tendency. You know, every hunt has that. I mean, another recent one is Florida. One of the most wild things that we saw there was every morning I started I started joking more and more. It's like, we're just waking up counting trucks. Like, we're not even going in anywhere because everywhere we go, we're, they're not just a truck in the parking lot or, or the pull-off. It's like there's trucks stacked 200 yards down the road, the whole road. But by about 10 o'clock, there was like nobody. And then as the day went on, you just saw fewer and fewer people to you know, the afternoon, you're talking none. We would drive around all afternoon and see like maybe one vehicle. Mm -hmm. And it was just crazy that that was (laughs) so consistent. Yep. Hunter patterns in new areas is interesting. I think that's, we have run into a similar thing that you were talking about. Um, I guess with glassing Mm -hmm. here with road calling, we had that incident where we heard a bird and heard two different people come down the road and try striking at it i think maybe someone owl hooted but i think several people were turkey calling at it and the thing didn't respond and they kept going and then once the cars were passed we owl hooted and the thing responded and what's also interesting about how we parked on that one is we didn't park in a position where we felt that he would hear our vehicle shut down you know whether it's stopping on the gravel which is a pretty distinct sound right like Pop and pop and pop and pop and stop. Yeah. You can hear it for Shut a off. long ways. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And because we did that, I think we were able to hear him pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. So we hear him trying to get a pinpoint on him. And then we start hearing these other vehicles. And it's just like you said. Mm-hmm. As soon and as they call. Similarly, I mean, the way things are set up and the way turkey hunting is a lot of times successful. There's a lot of ridge top parking and people accessing from the tops. And then... We've also been doing the same thing of just trying to walk in to find more creative listening points, especially because here, the the way the terrain is set up, like the distance of the hillsides and the folds that are in them, they can get into these pockets where they just disappear. It's and that's been the number one challenge. Mm -hmm. It's thrown me off for sure. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Similar example was that power line bird in Florida. Mm -hmm. Like he was in a power line very close to a road and anytime a car would drive by he would like kind of 
get a little weary and like r run off a few steps but then once he stopped hearing gravel pop he was right back to doing his thing spitting and, mm -hmm. and grooming yeah we should tell a quick story here of that hunt because yeah. because we haven't done i haven't really done anything on that one so keep this in mind everyone I'm, watching and listening yeah i'm working on that video right now okay so yeah. you'll be able to watch it on on the roy's channel but keep in mind that we're trying to film these hunts so like had this been a different situation and i was just out there hunting alone i would have not put myself in this position but i had shot a turkey already in the in the area and um roy hadn't yet that season because you'd been filming a lot and yeah. you know Cole just taking turns the day before yeah I'd taking turns for the first couple like five six days of the season and yeah then, yeah so it's kind of just you know sharing sharing the the gun time so i was planning on filming anyway but we were also planning on leaving while well, i was planning on leaving that day so we had said to ourselves all right this is our last stop we're gonna listen here and if nothing happens here we're gonna keep moving and at this point it was probably like 9 20 30 mm -hmm. and i told roy because we hadn't been walking much that day and i get a little restless I was like, I'm just going to go walking down this road calling, and we'll kind of call back and forth to each other. You know, generally when you do that, it's it's pretty safe from the standpoint of, like, you're not going to just bump into a turkey too often. It has happened, but not too often. So I'm walking down the road, calling, listening, nothing's happening. It's good listening conditions, too, calm. Just beautiful morning, really. And uh, I get to looking at my phone, I'm like, man, there's a power line just 150 yards through that timber. I can just sneak through there and pop out and give it a glass like a binocular glass not a glass cow <laughs> so i walk out there and i get about 50 yards from the edge of the power line i get in this super thick stuff and it's wet and it's i mean we're talking like little trees that are like this big and i'm you know snaking my way through it and as i'm going through i thought maybe i heard a gobble and to this day I'm, i don't know and i don't know that i ever will but it seems more likely that i did when you hear the outcome of the story I get right up to the edge and I start to kind of lean out and I look up to my left and standing on the roll of the power line 50 yards away from me is a Tom just standing there looking and he's not looking at me I can tell he's looking through me I'm just like oh here we go so I look at my phone of course you know can't get a hold of Roy and the plan was Roy to drive the truck up to me Right about this time, I look at my phone, and I'm like, well, I'm going to have to just film this turkey with my phone. Right about that time, I hear Roy fire the truck up and start driving. And that turkey just looks and darts across the power line, gets to the other side. And I'm like, oh, good. He's going to go in the woods. I'll be able to slide out of here, you know, get our gear ready and make a loop around him. He gets right to the other side and gets about five yards from the edge, and he just stops and looks up again. And as Roy rolls through, he just goes and turns and faces right at me and he's like 55 maybe at this point and i'm just like oh no and sure enough just one of those deals it's like it could happen a million times and you have a gun in your hand and he would never do that yeah. i mean i'm not kidding i'm standing by a tree that's like this big and the only thing that i think maybe helped me was the thick edge mm -hmm. was back cover and he was I, also like looking into, into the, the sun, sun. Yep. yep and i had like a little bit of cover kind of down low and I was just hunched over filming off the side of the tree and I took like three different clips I got a wide angle one I got a close one but he just comes through and just to do that half strut spit and just look spit look and the whole time he's just taking steps to me well Roy goes up turns around comes back down the road or I guess I'm assuming it was you and at this point no joke he's 15 yards from me and it's just I mean I could have shot him I could have shot him under the leg, I think, at that point, you know. <laughs> and Roy comes past, and when he comes past the second time, he darts off again, and he does kind of give a couple putts, and it's like, hmm. Like, he probably, at this point, can tell something's a little weird about where I'm standing, but I don't think he's bothered at all. Well, sure enough, I get out, get to Roy. We make a loop around him and eventually get him to gobble at, like, 10:45 maybe is that right? Mm -hmm. So about an hour and 20 minutes later, maybe pushing 11. 
We get them all fired up, but this time he's on the side of the power line that I had approached from, past the thick stuff in a more open edge. And we were trying to call him across the power line. And you'll have to watch the rest of the video to, you know, on Roy's channel to, to see the full outcome. But ultimately, uh, yeah, that was just a silly one. You know, it's one of those deals where you'd never do that if you were not trying you to film filming. your buddies. You know what I mean? You'd walk out there and be like, eh. If I'm going to go out there, I need to go get my gun. Like, you would think that. I mean, that, that's happened to me twice now filming. It's because I've been you know, focused on trying to find a turkey. I did it one time where I pulled into a spot on a day just like today. And I stood there and I hit a call. I did have a tag both times, too. So I could have shot a turkey both the time that I'm talking about mm. with Roy and with Ted. But I dropped Ted off one time. He had a call. <laughs> Nothing happened. And I was just thinking, like, this just seems good. Hit a call again. Bah, bah. I remember, like, <laughs> I'm standing, like, <laughs> as far away from the truck as we are right now. And the bird gobble, or two of them gobble. And I remember, like, looking at my gun, looking at the camera, looking at, you know, my gun again. I remember getting shells in my hand, and then it's just, like, too late, dude. Like, I don't even have time. And I look over. <laughs> I don't even have time to get the camera up. And I look over. No joke. Full full run around the corner and just see me and kind of like flap up and out of there and later that afternoon ted got one of them yep. super cool hunt i mean very very cool story on that one but similar frustration it anyway the same day i met y'all yeah so. <laughs> yeah it was <laughs> it's a bit of a side tangent there um quick storytelling moment but i don't really even know why we brought that up other than like i guess what is relatable is trying to pin more turkeys or pin yeah. more areas that it you was, hunt. it was on the the subject of like gravel popping and turkeys oh, right, being right, able right. To, That's right, yeah. to hear that and yeah. not necessarily yeah. like knowing not to to gobble to it yeah. the hunter tendencies mm -hmm. yes hunter tendencies what are some other hunter tendencies you guys have seen over the years like in any form of hunting i think your point about like owl hooting, like we were talking about locators mm -hmm. earlier, I think like the classic owl hoot is something that gets used a lot, and we've kind of started toying with just like different locating techniques mm -hmm. that aren't so predictable as just the the eight note. Yeah, like people or turkeys hear that all the time. I'm sure mm -hmm. up on the ridge, yep. hollow hoots, especially around here. Yeah. There's Hunt owls around here. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's the other thing. Like, yeah. You, you hear it from hunters, but then you also hear it from real owls. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's not until they start really breaking into the crazy, crazy owl talk yeah. that you generally hear the turkey gobble. I think doing, yeah, more shrill, just like you were just saying, something that's more it's it's easier I mean, to hear. I mean, they call it a shock yeah, gobble something because that's it's gonna make shocking mm -hmm. to the turkey. Yeah. Like, something that that gets them to go mm -hmm. yeah something that has changed in my opinion over the years is how often or how well i guess locators in general work and when i was younger hunting public lands i was always hunting areas that were pretty pressured and just between the gravel popping, the owl hooting, the striking off the road i just witnessed many a times what keith was saying in that um, a lot of those things people were doing weren't working. I mean, I'd be sitting in there listening to a turkey gobble, hear somebody pull up on the road, hit a call, and the turkey not respond to it, then drive away and the turkey start gobbling on its own again. So I saw that and then heard owl, people owl hooting like crazy to the point where I just became shy to it. I, I just didn't do it all the way up until I was really through college. I never did any owl hooting. Um, mostly because I just started to feel like the turkeys were picking up on that. And I think that to a certain degree, that's probably true. If it's been way overdone, I do believe there is a point where, you know, it doesn't work anymore. But to your point too, taking it a step further and just trying different things, like if everybody's owl hooting, maybe they don't gobble to an owl hoot, but maybe they will to a crow call or Maybe they will to a coyote howl at night, which I obviously wouldn't do a coyote howl in the middle of the day as I'm moving in on a turkey. But, you know, maybe you use a crow call or maybe you, I mean, Woodhaven makes a, a hawk call hmm, really? for a locator. Yeah, I mean, 
really any sort of thing that that's pretty cool is different one thing that i've always thought would be really cool if you can learn how to do the noise is the pileated woodpecker mm -hmm. i was just about to say that yeah. <laughs> yeah. i mean how many times have yeah. you heard that so many uh, times yeah. and i just think that um you know, thinking outside the box there is, is definitely important. But also, not being afraid to be loud with it. Like, one thing that I had done was, okay, I'm going to owl hoot, but I'm going to be really realistic with my owl hoots and not do it too loud. But then, over the years, I've started realizing, Jake has told me a lot, you, you should owl hoot louder. And then Roy was just, and I were just talking about this a couple nights ago, like, you know, just do it louder. And then... No joke, two nights ago we were out roosting and I did it with my call, which I think is very realistic and is loud enough. It has made them gobble already this season, but when I wasn't getting a response to that, I did it with my mouth and I just raised the volume probably twice as loud. And the very first time I did it, Turkey gobbled. He didn't do it anymore, but that was enough to like say, hey, there's one over in that direction. Yeah. And I just feel that that's something that um, is kind of... Yeah, it changed for me. Mm -hmm. Also, even hitting a turkey call louder. Like, I used to be super shy to that, too, for the same reasons, listening to people rip loud calls. And I think that there is a point where, you know, if you're doing something too loud, too close, too abruptly, it will spook a turkey. Yeah. But, but if you're trying to locate one, right. usually, mm -hmm. I mean, unless you're just unlucky and he's like 50 yards over right. the hill, like... But start quiet. Yeah, definitely. And then yeah. raise your for, volume. For that scenario, start quiet and mm -hmm. then raise the volume. Mm -hmm. And even on the same topic of, of like, locating, like, switch it up. If you get him to gobble to just, like, the regular, like, eight-note hoot mm -hmm. and he's not hitting it anymore and you're still trying to, like, get a better pin on him, like, just do a different noise. Mm -hmm. And that happened to Hayden and I the other night, and it worked out, so... He did more of the wah, 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 wah. Mm -hmm. and then boom, mm -hmm. yeah. old again. Yeah. I think that's something that over the years for me has just, yeah, changed a ton, really. I've just got to experience enough other people's approach to it, and that's another benefit of, you know, hunting and traveling is get to hunt with different people with different perspectives, and you start to see, okay, these things can work, especially when you sound realistic. Like, I think that's the other thing is, if you're going to turkey call really loud, like, still make sure that the cadence is right, you yeah. know? And and I think that um, sometimes hearing other hunters calling, too, it's like their cadence is wrong. I mean, they're doing things that just aren't really realistic to a turkey, and that, I think, can also make a turkey shut up quick. Like, maybe from a distance he's hearing it, and he's like, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to gobble and get closer to that. And then he hits a point where it's like... I mean, that ain't even my kind, mm -hmm. you know, when the yeah. cadence is too slow is a common occurrence. Like yeah. studying hens will tell you that there's kind of a base cadence there. It's not always going to be perfect, but you have that base. And then once uh, you kind of figure that out, yeah, it can speed up a little bit, but it rarely is slower than that. Where yeah. it's, mm -hmm. yelp, 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 uh -huh. yelp, yeah. yelp. Yeah. Well, what are some other things that you guys see in, in areas or... Or things Example. you catch yourself doing. Yeah, catch yourself mm -hmm. doing. Now here's one that we're doing right now, I think, is we're expecting to hear things up high. Yeah. Like This terrain is unique in the fact that there's no uniform ridges necessarily. Where other places I've hunted, even on this scale, still has some sort of uniform, I guess, finger ridge or secondary ridge, where maybe your top, you know, kind of goes up and down, has some high knobs, whatever. But then the, the fingers are more uniform. Like, they're all the same height. And they all go out about the same distance. And that can certainly vary. You know, one area you might have a ridge that, or, or fingers that go to a creek bottom that are a mile long. And another place you might have them where they go 300 yards down to the creek. But they're generally uniform. Where I feel like here, we're seeing a lot of examples where there's one ridge that's super long and another one that's maybe not as long but is taller mm -hmm. and then the next one over has like a strange saddle in it and you can you know look from one finger through that saddle to the other finger that's way up high and it's just they're kind of all over the place in height and length mm -hmm. off the top and i think as we've hunted this more and more we're all realizing that 
every single time we think we're hearing it all, we probably ain't even close. Yeah. And I think that's been the most interesting challenge that we've faced here. And I don't think that we've necessarily figured it out, but we've at least figured out, like we've we've checked that as figuring out one of the challenges of the areas, that's of my, this area. That's my biggest uh, biggest thing I've learned, biggest takeaway from here, mm -hmm. is just learning more about what you can and can't hear, mm -hmm. you know, and something that Hayden and I would not have learned if we had got the first gotten, one, gotten the one on the first day. So yeah, it's weirdly encouraging to be to to like have that where you kind of have that realization point, and you think there's actually more turkeys here yeah. than we thought. Yeah, I can get to places where I'm probably going to hear ones that I yeah I'm certainly not hearing from the road or even from a couple hundred yards off the road. There's there's very specific hearing pockets. Mm -hmm. I don't even like we were joking about. The hearing cone mm -hmm. earlier <laughs> yeah there's yeah little pockets where you can hear and then you can't there's w knobs there's a lot of what we would consider stadium ridges mm -hmm. like you were saying with imbalanced elevation and length mm -hmm. but w when we say stadium you've got one that's lower or significantly lower but everything around it no matter what shape or height it is it's taller than that one that's kind of at the on the field of the stadium mm -hmm. And when that's the case, a turkey gets behind that and you're way up here, I mean, good luck. Mm -hmm. Especially you throw water or wind or, you know, pines or some sort of vegetation that's mm -hmm. blocking sound and it becomes way more of a challenge. And I think that something that's definitely helped me get better at that is hunting elk as well. Because you have to k kind of get creative there where, okay, where can I actually go to where I'm going to be able to hear stuff? And then when you just get reps all turkey season, all elk season of doing that, you start to kind of say, hey, I'm probably not even hearing what that is over there because in this example, it sounded like this. So over here, there's no way I'm hearing it or I should be able to hear that. You know, I'm not going to worry that there's maybe one over there. I'm not going to waste my time walking over there when I know I should be able to hear that. And you just get more and more experience with that. So it's like, I feel like going into it, it's something that we harped on. But here we are, however many days later, and we're still learning how to uh, figure much, it out. I think, yeah, I think it's yeah. we it's, know we've always kind of known it to be on that list of challenges, mm -hmm. but it's been more of a challenge. It's than what exaggerated we thought. too because all, all the birds we've heard and seen are relating to bottoms. Yep. So when you're up mm -hmm. on the top, you're way away from that bottom, and like I would say, every bird has flown down, hit a bottom, and even if they've gone up to like a smaller ridge. Or a little stadium ridge within a pocket they've hit a bottom and gone up to it so they're pretty low compared to a lot of the access and a lot yeah. of the good ridges that you would consider good listening points yeah and i think maybe later in the season the turkeys will start to go up as mm -hmm. things start to green up at higher elevations mm -hmm. but just the way it is right now it's yeah. yeah it's certainly exaggerated yeah because in some hunts i mean <laughs> honestly we haven't hardly said it this year because we haven't experienced it but we started making the joke several years ago now, sun come up, and that's in reference to a lone turkey walking his butt up to the top to just hammer gobbles. And when they're doing that, it becomes A, easier to hear them, because they're gobbling from essentially a listening point for us, and also they're alone, and they're way more willing to move in the direction of a hen. So calling them is much easier. But we have not experienced a single sun coming up <laughs> except for the bulldoze bird. That's yeah. the only mm -hmm. one. Yeah. And that was the first day. And he probably learned real quick after y'all bumped him that season's now open. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but yep. I, I think as that elevation, the higher elevation starts to green, which it is, which we've talked about, it's starting to change. You're going to start seeing more turkeys breaking up, hens going to nest, Tom's starting to get alone and gobble later into the morning, go up to those high points. So these tactics may even change, but we do know for next time, in a situation similar, it may be in a totally different state. It could be in Maine in mid to late May mm -hmm. that you're experiencing these same conditions. But if you're yep. in a similar situation down the road, you know for next time. And I think that's the thing too. It's like, if you always go to the hot spot and you never experience challenge, 
you're going to have a harder time learning these things. And then when you do hit these challenges, you're not going to be able to keep your confidence and keep having fun. I think that's the biggest thing too, is like, we've been able to continue to have a blast this entire time, even though it's been, I mean, this is top three, baby, of mm -hmm. like toughest things I've done in the turkey woods. Yeah. Like this is a, this is going down in the memory books of like, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> that one was a struggle. And we may mm -hmm. end up having to come back someday, you know, like just to try to figure it out again because who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're hoping, we're hoping, hoping, hoping that we're going to get on <laughs> something, but who knows? We're, with the rain and, and the conditions, you know, yeah. it's, we haven't really hunted at all today, so yep. it's just, t it's tough, it's tough, and we know that, and that's what we want. We want to experience tough. Are the turkeys tough, though? No. I think no, the, no. Condition, the conditions and time of year, mm -hmm. and the ter and just being new to, like, and all that, I think at some yeah. point it's going to click. And there's going to be a lot of easy turkeys running around. Yeah, oh, <laughs> yeah. And then it's probably going to get a little tougher after that. Yeah. When a lot of when those some get of killed. them get missed. Yeah, <laughs> missed <laughs> killed. Right. killed, missed. Yeah. 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 And I just think, I guess my belief is having hunted in, you know, a lot of different regions and even different subspecies. It's like, yeah, some some turkeys have slightly different tendencies, but like. I've listened to Eastern's gobble just as much as a Merriam's. I've listened to quiet Rio's. I've listened to, you know, Eastern's that gobble and run the other way that do exactly the same thing as a Merriam. Like, a turkey is a turkey at the end of the day in my experience. And, like, I think that if you go enough, you will eventually agree with that. You know, I think you can have certain experiences where it's just like, that's the easiest place to ever hunt. But it's like I've had experiences that are that are contrary to popular belief for the area. Whether that's it's supposed to be really bad and it's really good and it's supposed to be really good and it's really bad. I've had both of that time and time again over and over. Yep. And I Every like that. Every situation's unique yeah. within a, mm -hmm. within an area. I mean, you can you, and you can also just like roll right into a spot and shoot one. That's mm -hmm. crazy. Doesn't yeah. happen that often so like enjoy it and embrace it but at the same time like you know sometimes it happens in the places that it's not supposed to happen in and i think that mm -hmm. just tells you a lot about man eh, well, a turkey's a turkey yeah and uh, the fact that you can roll into like any place and shoot one is also proof that a turkey's a turkey like <laughs> right if, if you know how to read how the turkey is reading their environment, environment. yeah then, that's a good point yeah i think anywhere You'll find that hunters are leaving the woods at like nine or yeah. ten. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd say f for all species too. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Yeah. It's like I mean, people have to work. Mm -hmm. But yeah, absolutely. But but even still. Yeah, like if you've got a Tuesday off, you know, maybe that's the day that you just even if you want to sleep in, sleep in, but hunt the rest. Of, you know, the rest of the day out and focus on, you know middle of the day just as as much as you would beginning or end of the day yeah. or if you can only hunt evenings don't be afraid to hunt evenings you know things like that and things like this yeah um in my experience i feel like if you can get two day like two all day sets in the wood yeah that's that's more valuable than if you can get like five mornings yeah like yeah. if you can spend all of all of your time out in the woods listening and in learning mm -hmm. that I've, I've found it to be a lot more valuable. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, there's so many times looking back on hunts where it's been this progression of going in scouting, finding the sign and then going back at a more prime time. Even if you can only hunt one more morning or one more evening, whatever it may be, just finding that sign and going back in there with confidence at a prime time. Because I think one thing that's easy to do is, and this is, is, I'm speaking for all species here, not just turkeys. If you roll into a spot at the heat of the day, everything's kind of gone quiet, nothing's, everything's either laying down, not gobbling, whatever, not doing anything. And you see this fantastic sign. And then your confidence just goes down when you don't get a response to your call or you're set up in a funnel during deer season and nothing comes through. It's like, well... If it's blown up with sign, maybe just revisit it at that prime time. And, you know, when that's been done, 
it seems like it just time and time again proves to be just the right approach. Like go find that sign at less than ideal times and then revisit it when you've got a prime time. And I'll use an example of turkey. You're deep in somewhere middle of the day and it's like two o'clock and all of a sudden you come across a saddle that's shredded with scratching. You find a dust bowl, you find strut marks, like there's a turkey that Tom going through there. You know it. But you get up on the high point and you hit a call, you hit a loud call, nothing responds. You're like, man, I know I should be spending time here, but I'm tired. You know, I ran out of food and I got the whole rest of the day. It's like, I would be, I would rather completely pull out, go get reset. With, I mean, even if that's not even going back till the next morning. And then go in there at the prime time and be ready in that spot, knowing that when he goes gets to gobbling you're going to be able to hear it rather than like burn yourself out on it too if that makes sense like when you find that sign that's telling you there's definitely something here then i say absolutely focus your time in prime time that's what i think yeah there's just been so many examples where we've done that over the years and it's been very beneficial but at the same time if you got all the food and water in the world and you're planning on setting up there like yeah, just park it if you can. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying don't burn yourself out on it, like hoping that all of a sudden it's going to let loose. Because if it is windy or or really hot in the middle of the day and you're turkey hunting or deer hunting, whatever it is, yeah, I mean, they may just not come through there at that time. Yeah. But you shouldn't lose confidence on that fresh sign because they're not going anywhere. They're not. No matter what anybody on the on the hunt media tells you, they're not leaving. Yeah, and I didn't. I didn't mean necessarily. No, yeah, like, I don't. I don't think just, we're disagreeing either. Just set in no, a place with right. good sign all for like two days straight. No, I, I mean, know like, what you meant. Be, be in the woods yeah. trying existing, to learn, existing mm -hmm. out there. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think that also helps you get a gauge of what sign is the best sign that I can find. Like mm -hmm. you were yeah. saying about visiting more areas, that's going to help you hone in on what is the best spot that i should be at and should yeah. be focusing because that's my different time. everywhere mm -hmm. yeah for all species mm -hmm. yeah like. it's hard to get that especially for deer hunting i would say mm -hmm. just getting a grasp of how much sign deer are laying down turkeys is like if you're finding tracks and feeding sign or scratchings of some sort you know there's turkeys around but yeah i feel like deer sign is weird because over the years having traveled to different areas deer hunting you may go to one place and the standard for the amount of rubs you're seeing is super high like you're we're talking like hundreds of rubs potentially a lot of times i think that just comes down to the make of the trees or the deer density or kind of a combination like if you got a bunch of willows in iowa for example it's going to be shredded you got a high deer density and they're trees that deer just rub in general it doesn't really matter if they're a you know a year and a half old six pointer or a, oh, a mega monster they're rubbing those trees yeah where if you're in a setting like this, in the mountains, where you've got tons of t timber, a low deer density, the buck sign that we've seen here is, I mean, man, we've walked several, several, like, three, four mile loops and seen a handful of rubs. Yeah. But you find, and we find them, and we point at them, we're like, heck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we find, like, three a day, but they're a pretty good sign of where that buck is probably spending a lot of the time, or it's in the really obvious cruising saddle mm -hmm. rut sign but we found a lot of spots where you can see where the buck is bedded and that's the only spot where there's a, any congregation of rubs mm -hmm. a very small handful yep yeah and just like being able to go come back here someday knowing that's what to expect is also helpful one of my favorite parts about turkey hunting is is knowing that someday there's a darn good chance i'm going to loop back to either this area you know, th this area meaning one of whatever, however many, like coming back to that area to deer hunt or an area that's very similar and you're getting those gauges every time too for deer. Like over the last for sure two or three deer s or turkey seasons, I've started focusing on using this as my scouting time. Living in Colorado now, I don't have like the opportunity to scout out east nearly as much as I did obviously when I li lived there. And now I just use this time to really focus on learning deer tendencies just as much as turkey se tendencies in turkey season. And I'm constantly scouting for j 
just how they're using the landscape. Like, how are they using this habitat and this uh, terrain? That way, if I find myself in something similar, you can just have a similar expectation. And that, that's one thing that is also similar about deer hunters is, to turkey hunters, is they also like to say how different it is. And I was thinking about this the other day. It's like, I've been up in the northeast a fair amount. Not a fair, not a crazy amount, but I've been up there and I've attempted tracking up in the mountains there. And then you're here, and you think, this is the same exact stuff, and they never get snow. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, talk about a whole new added challenge. It's like you're just banking on snow if you live up in the northeast, or you can bank on snow. I'm not saying everybody does that, but, mm -hmm. I mean, just keep in perspective that it's like there's always another list of challenges. And that's not to say one is harder than the other. They're all a challenge. This was not supposed to be easy from the beginning. If it was easy, then... You know, you'd, you'd build a fence and you'd keep them in there, you know, and, and that's not something that we're not trying to get that experience. If you wanted to just get a big buck every time, yeah, you just put a fence around them. But like they're wild animals. They have an instinct to survive. They're not trying to, you know, the turkey's not coming in like, you know what? I'm going to go kiss that gun barrel. I'm going to make it easy <laughs> this time. They're not thinking that. And with a deer... You know, obviously, like, they're not just going to come in and present you a bronze-side <laughs> shot very often. That's just not realistic. And we do want that on occasion. I mean, I, absolutely, you're out hunting day in and day out, and you're not seeing anything. At a certain point, you're like, yeah, give me the gimme. I've been there for sure. I mean, I'm kind of there right now. <laughs> <laughs> As we sit in pouring rain. But, like, keep in mind that the challenge of it is what really is keeping you coming back. It absolutely is. And when you start to, I guess, you know, be okay with that, I feel that at least for me, it has just made the whole experience that much more enjoyable. And that's why I love hunting new areas, man. Love it. Mm -hmm. Love going and, and getting a real good kick in the butt sometimes of like, hey, you got to learn more because this is, this is different than what you've experienced. I like that. Yeah. Keeps you learning. You could just yeah. always go back to the same old, same old, man. You Big can, old farm. I get tired of it. Yeah, I yeah. definitely get tired of it. Yeah, But you can always come back to it. Right, yeah. 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 Well, and it's going to make that That's hunt much yeah. easier, too. Mm -hmm. You're just going to be like, okay, like this spot is going to be good in this situation or these conditions or whatever where you may not look at it that way without, you know, broadening your, mm -hmm. your experiences. Yeah. Yeah, it's really fun to go back to, like, uh, like my grandparents' property or like your parents' property. I remember the first time after hunting in Iowa for a season, going back to your parents and standing there with Ben and being like, this whole thing's a cruising route. And we were just like, whoa. <laughs> it, it, you know, it is. And it just dawned on us that at that point because it's like I had looked at it from a different perspective because I went and got a bunch of different perspectives mm -hmm. that were in similar country. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of what, what we were looking at in Iowa was similar to you know, central Ohio, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. Yeah. anyway, I don't know. I'm probably just getting to rambling, bull. Just it's rambling rough. because it's raining and we can't go hunting. <laughs> We're just <laughs> rambling. Final thoughts? Oh, I mean, it's still fun. It's always fun. It's definitely fun. It's fun to get your it's butt never kicked. Never really not fun. No. Mm -hmm. Unless you're, get, like, so like, in the rain. I was going to say, unless it's yeah. raining, <laughs> we're on the verge today. It's not been great, but yeah. it's been all right. It's still, I mean, it's still fun. It is fun because we get to yeah. joke. We're, we're joking with buddies, and, you know, we're still getting to go outside, even if it's raining. But I'm hoping yeah. that this is kind of the Hop end the of it. the truck and cruise around a little bit until yeah. it shuts yeah. down. Yeah. At least until it gets dark. Yeah. And we'll Go we'll back, road, go to sleep, work. and then wake we'll up go in the to, morning and probably... go to Taco Bell and <laughs> come back and go see our friend James at Taco Bell. <laughs> Shout out. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.